What does it mean to be silent? Does it mean a form of quiet contemplation? Is it thinking upon things and searching one's own mind for answers to life's big questions? Or does this only indicate another type of noise, a subtlety of the ego to wax poetic about things which it cannot comprehend? And so the mind, in its silent anguish, must disguise this fact by incessantly taking control of the silence, by enshrouding it with endless circular dialogue to maintain the illusion that one has at least a basic comprehension of reality based upon illogical proofs of sheer consistency and repetition of action. Ritualistic actions or thoughts prove nothing, except that an individual or a collective group are willing to rotate their bodies and minds to create movements and notions that bring about a certain order. This then creates the required circumstances for the mind to believe that it has things figured out, and that all of reality is comprised of the limits that are confined within the circle of rotation. All of that which is outside the rotation is considered to be foreign, mythological, delusional, inconceivable. Thus, any who dare to quest beyond these confines and question the narrative are also considered delusional, conspiratorial, and even dangerous. It is easy to hear and repeat the things spoken about within the prison walls of this system because this maintains the collective ego and the safety net of the circle. Those who dare to venture outside of this system are seen as a most dangerous threat. The philosopher is the beginning of this threat, which is why a Socrates has to be sentenced to death. The mystic or sage who delivers a different message will always have to be crucified. The most dangerous element to the system of the circle is silence, because in true silence one can listen to nothing and therefore hear everything. In silence, the circular narratives are seen for what they are, shadows to be chased after in an endless loop. In silence, there can be instruction. In silence, the student is ready and the master appears. An individual or collective can delude themselves into believing that there is somewhere to go in a circle, but as the journey unfolds and reaches its inevitable denouement, there will be the realization, at least to some, that there is nowhere to go. We have reached the end, which is just back to the beginning. Birth, life, death, rebirth. This is what makes it a game. All games are loops, which is why they can be played over and over again. The game exists. It is designed. It has rules and boundaries. Of course, within the game are the players, referees, and the audience. The players are given a side to be on and on the other side is the enemy. And this is seen as real with thoughts and emotions that create notions of validity in regard to these feelings. Those who are in the game never want to think that their emotions are invalid because they are playing the game to win, no matter what the cost. Those in the game do not even want to believe that it is just a game. The noise of the game is loud and its fundamental premise is about getting the most goals or points. All of life is a game of goals and the desire to attain them. Create a goal, chase it, win the points, create another goal, chase it, win the points. Enough of these self-fulfilled prophecies and one is seen as potentially winning the game of life. It becomes games within games. These desires destroy the master and the student seeks out their purpose in an endless pursuit of these goals, listening only to themselves or to others doing the same. The pupil remains blind. Silence is impossible in a sea of noise. Silence only becomes possible when one sees the game for what it is. Sees the players, the referees, the audience. Sees the rules and boundaries and the circular nature of the structure. Sees that these are all just illusions and that one is simply chasing after their own shadow. Attachment is the ultimate weapon against the enemy of this house. Attachment negates silence, because there is so much noise created with all that one becomes linked to. Attachment, by its very nature, requires choice, and therefore manifests polarity which creates division. Division becomes conflict, and the eternal struggle carries forward. Ultimate detachment can never make a choice of this person over that one, and is therefore able to empathize with everything. 
Can it be seen through this that God, therefore, can never have a chosen people? Those caught in the noise of the larger game and their own smaller game are unfortunately unable to see this, and will therefore continue to ride the circle. The analogy holds true, and after all games are over, there is declared a winner and a loser, and the two sides become unified in their agreement to have played it in the first place. They shake hands and thank each other for the competition. God shakes hands with the devil. It is time to reset the board and begin another one, a different one. The basis will be the same, but the theme will change. A new world will have to be created. A new world will need to be born. And everything that is done must be done symbolically, as symbols are the language of the universe. The big question to the attentive is why? Why all of this? Why the game? Why is there life and death? Why becomes the most fundamental question. It is a haunting question too, which is often dismissed as redundant or too complex to delve into by any who just want to get back to the all-important business of running in the circular human race. Circular mindset, circular actions. This is how judgment operates along with its counterparts such as prejudice, racism, and choice. Choice is pain, even or especially when the choices are not your own. Imagine the feeling of only ever being considered as a second choice or an alternate option. Perhaps for many hearing this, it has been your experience. Perhaps it has been your only experience. Within these previous statements is a profound truth to any who have the ears to hear it. In silence, there is empathy. And within that silence, there can be felt an overwhelming magnitude of pain within this world, within the earth itself, and within its inhabitants. The answer to this question of why is found within this pain, because the pain that is here requires great healing, and healing takes time. Time creates the circle, and what can potentially be perceived as an endless work. It is unfortunate that the truth of this great work has been discovered by certain members within it, and is used as an advantage for so-called personal gain and selfish ambitions. They see the healing process as being futile, and have therefore relegated themselves to being permanent fixtures in the game. The truth has made them jaded and nihilistic. Nevertheless, the process continues because it must. In this, there is no choice, just as with breathing or with life and death. A breath in and a breath out. Life then death, life, then death. Magnitude or volume creates an escalation of pain. This is mathematically obvious. The more minds that have pain, which is all minds in various degrees, the more pain there is within the construct. Larger numbers create more confusion, and out of that confusion there is eventually disorder. Without any control whatsoever within that disorder, there would inevitably be chaos, and from that chaos, an ensuing nightmare. There are those who ask how to be free of this system, yet bring more confusion into it, a blatant contradiction if there ever was one. Those who have chosen not to add to the confusion are more in alignment with the healing process. There is enormous spiritual pain in moments of great transition. Security and assurance are constructs of repetition, when that continuity is broken, there is doubt, fear, depression, anxiety, panic, and a host of other emotions that were always there, albeit slightly hidden, but just waiting to break through the surface at the slightest scratch against one's esteemed sense of security. The unknown becomes frightening because the barrier of the circle has been broken, and there becomes in these moments of uncertainty an ever greater willingness to do whatever it takes to maintain the structure of those boundaries. Boundaries, which are labeled as normal. Normality becomes a prison, and the citizens confined within it are willing to fight to protect its walls. Walls that gave them a continual sense of purpose and direction, even if it was only in a circle of repetition. This has also been called life. A life without protection is vulnerable, but only in the sense that there is a threat to act upon that vulnerability. When there are no threats, one is free, but when there are enemies, there is a need to be guarded. The compounding of this principle means that there can become so many dangers that one needs to outsource their protection, and this eventually becomes governance. 
Populace is formed, dividing walls and property lines are drawn, and the laws of protection accumulate. As a rule, the more protection, the less freedom, until there is none. It is a simple analogy. Ultimate trust is thus handed over to the governing authorities to deal with any and all external threats, and what is asked for in return from every individual is allegiance. A citizenry may even be willing to give up their very soul for that protection. The biology, it seems, must be protected at all costs. That is the power of attachment. That is the power of fear. When the populaces become so large, the external threats become so dangerous as to create the potential for all sides to be annihilated. At this point, the authorities of each government see that there is a need to work together, so they do not also destroy each other in the process of a cataclysmic hot war. These alliances create for a time an unprecedented measure of peace. However, resources are limited in any system, and inevitably there will be a turn in the threat. The populace themselves become the rival, and instead of an external enemy, there will be the need to protect the world against the ever-growing and demanding internal adversary. Every peak is followed by a valley. At this point, a Trojan horse of sorts is necessary. The potential adversary is now regarded as being absolutely anyone, therefore the forms of protection will turn from the external to the internal. The circle must always complete itself. It will also be obvious that the forms of protection now offered are as unified as the actions of a single governing body as opposed to separate ones, since the rules will also be unified and mandatory regardless of so-called national borders. Any who do not abide by the new restrictions to protect the greater good of the world public will also be seen as a threat. And threats are often eliminated from the equation as they pose a risk for too many other variables to occur. All of this is an easy sell, since the idea of normal must be reinstituted and guarded no matter what measures need to be taken. It matters not what normal looks like at this point, only that the measures of protection are enforced for the good of everyone. Normal thus becomes despotic, since everything becomes unitarian. If everyone is collectivized, the notion of individual freedom is quashed. Duality becomes singularity. Two visions become one. It is the beginning of a perfect vision. It is the beginning of a new world. The question to be asked is, why is division always equated with freedom? The proof of this is devastatingly obvious. Create a world by destroying it, and within this equation, humanity itself becomes the ultimate paradox. It should be impossible that one equals zero, yet here we are. Within this equation are all the ingredients necessary to facilitate the experiencing of the ultimate limits of both pleasure and pain. Pain is the trade-off, since the pleasure seems to be worth the price. Nobody, it seems, is trying to protect pain or the things that cause it. Otherwise, what does healing even mean? Yet, what does pleasure mean without the comprehension of pain? It is this pleasure that is desiring to be protected, and there is a hefty price for this protection, and at some point that price needs to be paid. The questions to be asked at this point are, who is the one that has sent the bill? What is the price, and how is this hidden price tag supposed to be paid? If there is a continual compounding of pain, eventually there is going to be an emergency situation. In any emergency, if left unchecked and untended, the resulting consequence will be the demise of that which is in the state of needing urgent care and attention. This is obvious on an individualistic level, but it does not seem to be very clear when related to universal systems. If there is truly no separation between the source and its consequence, then the ending of pain must also be found at its beginning. The created meet their creator. Life must be followed by death, which is back to the starting point of life. The principle of healing is characterized not by any cure absolute, but simply by continually going back to the point where the pain, wound, cut, or disease initially began. 
Time, which is the healer, begins and yet it also ends, exactly at the same moment it began, and therefore becomes a paradox, trapped within its own contingent affirmation. Again, nowhere to go. Pain and pleasure, the wound and the healing, are two aspects of the same coin, and the one cannot happen or exist without the other. It is the denial of this which creates continuity and the need for the circle and the eternal game. How then can anyone possibly be protected from destiny? To outsource one's protection for scant surety within a temporal existence is a grandiose absurdity. Any who argue in rage to defend that choice are concealed from the fact that there is no protection from ultimates, no matter how many taxes are paid or guns are in the armory. When presented with this, denial itself becomes the greatest protector. Knowledge becomes pain, and ignorance becomes bliss. Silence becomes truth.